Are we ready, everyone? Thanks for hanging out. It's uh, time uh, for me to in, uh, introduce Robin Murphy from La Trobe University, who's a member of the International Research Group on Biochemistry of Exercise, and she's gonna introduce our uh, Young Investigator Award winner. Thanks, David, and I will take this opportunity to thank you personally, but on behalf of everyone, and I know that will happen again before the end of the proceedings, but it has been absolutely marvellous. And thank you for everyone for being here to listen to the Young Investigator Award. Um, I've got a couple of things to, to say about that, and I'm going to start off with the previous winners of the award. And so you can see the um, esteem with which the recipient this year sits. Um, it's quite a few coming out of Denmark here, as you'll see. Uh, but that's the way things go with the biochemistry of exercise, and Eric Richter's got a, a, a clap to share with us. Um, so this is awarded to a publication in the field of biochemistry of exercise, which can be quite diverse. And this year we had over 20 um, applications for the award, which is more than we've had previously. There was a robust um, judging process that we went through. It was difficult uh, because there were such good um, papers that were submitted, but we did come to a uh, unanimous decision in the end. And this year's recipient is Carlos Enriquez Olguin. So, <laughs> of course, we had announced that already. So Carlos is prepared to share the paper with us. But I'll just give a little bit of a um, background to Carlos. He um, is at the University of Copenhagen and he's a postdoctoral fellow there and he's been there for around five years. Part of that time he's been funded as a Danish diabetes fellow. And prior to that, um, Carlos graduated with his PhD from the University of Chile and that was in molecular physiology and biomedical sciences. Having a look through Carlos's CV, he attends scientific conferences frequently, uh, not over the last couple of years, but he attends them and he receives awards for going to these conferences. So I think that there's a pattern there uh, that, so perhaps you're not that surprised, Carlos, I'm not sure. Uh, notably, he won the European College of Sports Science Young Investigator Award over the last few years. Uh, in terms of publications, he's got 40 publications in total, nine of which are first authors, and he's also got a couple of book chapters. So already have you've uh, achieved so much in your career. So congratulations, Carlos. If you'd like to come up here, I've got a certificate of to present with you, to you. Thank you very much. It's a true honor to receive this uh, IBEC Young Investigator Award. Um, I would like to thank the, uh, the group for giving me this recognition. Um, I'm sure it was difficult, and I'm sure uh, every other nominee can actually deserve this award as much as I do. So as you can see, my presentation today is called Illuminating the Role of Compartmentalized Redox Signals in skeletal muscle stress adaptations. My presentation is going to be divided into two parts. The first part will be the paper I, I was awarded by, which is my PhD work, and uh, I will continue the second part with uh, unpublished data that actually derived from that paper. So in this paper, we got so many questions uh, and went so many ideas, so I wanna show you some of them. So, Life is nothing but an electron looking for a place to rest. This is a famous quote of the Nobel Prize winner, Albert Sanger G. You might say life is a bit more complicated than a single electron. But um, 
what uh, Sanjay G actually tried to explain in this quote is that uh, is put the emphasis on of, uh, this electron transfer reactions in all living systems. So all cells rely on oxidation react, uh, reduction um, reactions, which is shown here. So our cells oxidize the carbons we, uh, in the food we eat and reduce the oxygen we breathe in order to produce energy. So therefore, redox reactions are one of the more fundamental uh, reactions in, or processes in redox biology and make life possible. So in cellular metabolism, <laughs> in cellular metabolism um, there is a complex uh, amount of redox reactions where molecules are oxidized and reduced constantly and to sustain energy demands. So in some, in some cases, uh, molecules are not entirely oxidized or reduced, creating reactive molecules. For example, oxygen, which is a nice uh, electron acceptor, can be one electron reduced, and this will be an incomplete reduction, and will form this anion superoxide. And anion superoxide is produced in cells all the time in different contexts. One of them is, is actually exercise. So this was actually published for the first time in one, uh, for um, Kelvin Davis in this paper, where they actually described that free radicals increase during exercise in muscle and liver. And they associate this with muscle damage. Why? Because uh, superoxide can be actually converted to hydrogen peroxide by superoxide dismutases. And it can actually get, uh, a, 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 so hydrogen peroxide can decide here whether to go to degradation, whether to go to fenton reaction, or go, where to go to cysteines, which are waiting for him. So after 40 years of research, we know now that hydrogen peroxide is a central molecule in redox biology. And it will modify cysteine residues and will promote cellular signaling. And interestingly, redox signaling and hydrogen peroxide is actually involved in adaptation to exercise. However, there is, uh, yeah, there is a, 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 a large amount of stuff we don't know about redox signaling. One of them is where those rods during exercise are produced. And there are different uh, areas where or cellular side where ROS can be produced. The first one was actually proposed was mitochondria, as you may know. So mitochondria can produce anion superoxide in, in 11 different sites, but the, the more uh, commonly known are complex one and complex three. So as you can see, it's, it's produced superoxide and can be really quickly converted in hydrogen peroxide. But there are other sites, and this is uh, the family of uh, NADPH oxidase. NADPH oxidase is a very conserved family, which the main function is produce ROS. So they are, they are made to produce superoxide, so they are professional superoxide producers. So there, there must be a reason why we have NADPH oxidases in muscle. So a skeletal muscle express NOx2 and NOx4, in the picture, you can see NOx2. The NOx2 is a, a complex of min, uh, several subunits, as you can see here. So there is uh, two proteins are, are in the membrane and the T-tubules, and the regulatory subunits are here. And for this presentation, just remember P47 and RAC1. We can just forget these ones for now. And when uh, NOx2 is activated, um, electron from NADPH and transferred to oxygen to form uh, superoxide. And then superoxide dismutase 3, the extracellular superoxide dismutase, actually convert in hydrogen peroxide, and hydrogen peroxide get back to the fiber. So um, a number of the studies of different labs have suggest that NOx2 can actually be the responsible for uh, contraction simulated rust production. So it was first proposed, I guess, for Alejandro Spinoza and Enrique Heimer's lab, followed for some work in, uh, in, um, from uh, uh, different other groups. Um, 
However, the, the role or the relative contribution of mitochondria and NOx2 to exercise simulated ROS production in vivo is not really known. So we wanted to know this, and for this we designed uh, a series of experiments where we start uh, t wondering whether exercise can actually induce re reactive oxygen species generation in human muscle. So uh, we did uh, a small uh, a human study where we measure uh, in human biopsies electron uh, rust production during exercise uh, in acute bout of exercise. So as you can see here, we use uh, this DCFH uh, dye that um, in contact with oxygen increase its fluorescence. So as you can see here, reactive oxygen species or total oxygen increase during exercise in human muscle. But we wanted to know the relative contribution of NOx2 to this phenomenon. So we took advantage of mouse model and then we, um, we took these mice that are carrying a bone mutation in P47 subunit, which is one of the initiation of the activation of NOx2. Those mice are called uh, NS, NF, uh, NCF1. And then we did the same experiment we did in humans. And as you can see here, Walter mice show the same proxidative shift that the uh, human uh, did, but in, in the NCF mice, this was completely gone. So this was really exciting, was really um, motivated, but then we wanna go a little bit more. Why? Because uh, DCF, you might say, is, is not really uh, giving any information about the raw source or the chemical nature of the species. So then we, um, we use another tool, which is this uh, redox, uh, uh, redox sensitive GFP is a fluorescent protein that is modified to be sensitive to hydrogen peroxide. And on top of that, it's actually um, coupled to a uh, bacterial peroxidase called ARP, which is really sensitive to hydrogen peroxide. So this makes this probe really sensitive mostly to hydrogen peroxide man, m more than other reactive oxygen species. So we designed an experiment where we put this wild type and NCF mice and then we express a mitochondrial target, your raw GFP, and a cytosolic target, your GFP, in the same mice. So in one leg was this mitochondrial target, your GFP, and in the other leg was the cytosolic target, your GFP. So this mice ran, and then we measured the oxidation of this uh, cellularly target, your GFP. So what we saw is uh, unexpectedly, actually, we observed a reduction in uh, the dynamics of uh, hydrogen peroxide in the mitochondria matrix. So it was, it was really amazing to see that instead of uh, going up, hydrogen peroxide in the mitochondria went down. And then there are a few posters over there that I could explain that, uh, maybe by uh, calcium, uh, mitochondrial calcium. But then we measure, we, we look at the cytosolic raw GFP and we saw an increase in cytosolic raw GFP oxidation. And this was completely gone in the uh, NCF mice. So this really suggests that uh, during exercise, at least moderate intensity exercise, cytosolic rods are the main source and this is NOx2 dependent in mice. But we wanna measure NOx2 activity during in vivo exercise, which has not been done so far. So we use the same ROGFP technology, but in this case was fused to a P47 side unit. So this allows us to measure um, reactive oxygen species actually in the NOx2 nanodomains. So we use a, a RAG, a inducible RAG1 muscle specific mice, the RAG1 knockout, um, and, uh, which as, you, as I mentioned before, is member of the NOx2 complex. So we use uh, the single fi uh, fiber model at the beginning to uh, start uh, to study this in vitro. And this is a radiometric dye. So one of the channels will increase its fluorescence in contact with ROS and the other will decrease. And, and in fact, this is what happened in the wild type mice, as you can see, after electrical stimulation. But this was completely gone in the rock one uh, knockout mice. But this is a still in vitro. So we wanna do it in vivo. So we use this uh, read of histology method which we preserve the cysteine residues in the raw GFP, and we keep it, and then what we saw was a powerful increase of NOx2 activity during exercise in vivo. And surprisingly, this was 
or maybe not surprisingly, but it was nice to see it, that uh, was completely gone in the RAG1 muscle-specific organ mice. So, that's when Liger uh, entered. So she publishes a series papers of papers, really nice, showing that uh, RAG1 actually is, is very important in regulating glucose uptake by insulin, by stress, by exercise. Um, and this is by our regulating glute for translocation. So then, of course, we thought, okay, maybe RAG1 is acting by NOx2. And this is not new. I mean, ROS reduction has been related to muscle glucose uptake since probably this paper uh, in the early 90s from John Hulosi lab. That they proposed hydrogen peroxide could be one of the signals that promote glucose uptake. But the mechanism was not really well known. So then we ask a very simple question. Is this uh, effect of RAG1 by an OX2? So we did uh, this experiment where we actually measure uh, radioactive uh, ra radio label glucose accumulation in the muscle during exercise. And we saw that uh, wild time mice increase it, uh, its uh, glucose uptake during exercise, but that's, that's hugely reduced in the NOx2 deficient mice. Interestingly, we also see this reduction in, in lactate. Uh, so we, 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 th we, yeah, we say, okay, how this can be explained? And then we, maybe it's mitochondrial defect, maybe it's, it's a capillary density or fiber type differences. But we measured this stuff and many others, and we couldn't find any other differences. But we, we saw uh, changes in substrate utilization, which is the same defect we see in drug one nogar mice. So uh, then we asked whether this could be explained by glutes for translocation. But we want to measure, of course, in vivo. So uh, we use this glutes for GFP, which is also MIGTAC in the exophagial uh, um, domain of the glute 4. So that's allowed us to measure glutes 4 when it's in the plasma membrane using anti uh, antibodies. So as you can see here, uh, exercise stimulate glute 4 translocation in the wild type, but this was completely reduced or highly reduced in the NOx2 deficient mice. So this clearly showed that um, exercise stimulate uh, glute 4 translocation and glucose uptake via RAG1 NOx2 uh, dependent pathway. So yeah, what I have shown you so far is that the exercise increased cytosolic ROS that actually stimulate glucose uptake and glute 4 translocation. But what, what was here, was, was really interesting, is that we saw at the same time increase in cytosolic ROS and a decrease in mitochondrial ROS. So that suggests this is very compartmentalized. It, and then probably looking at the whole lysate or the whole cell level, it will give us a, a wrong impression. So we found this fascinating, and we want to follow a little bit, and I will show you some data we have produced in the last year. So the question is simple. What control redox compartmentalization in the skeletal muscle? Can hydrogen peroxide diffuse from one place to another? So it's a simple question, but it's really difficult to do in the lab. So we use this uh, chemogenetics, which has been developed um, during the last, uh, last decade, which is um, this D uh, recombinant D-amino acid oxidase, which produces hydrogen peroxide uh, using D-amino acids as a substrate. So we can express this enzyme in different cellular compartments and turn it on the system and then give the substrate and then it will produce ROS as a main product, in this case, hydrogen peroxide. So then we can follow this uh, in the cells using these ultra-sensitive hydrogen peroxide biosensors. And then we can put this biosensor in many, in many places. For instance, we can, we can put it in the plasma membrane of muscle cells, in the cytosol, in the nuclear, or in the mitochondria. So we'll produce ROS in one place and we will measure it in another just to see this uh, hydrogen peroxide dynamic inside of the cell because we think this is very compartmentalized. So we did the experiment and then when we produce ROS in the cytosol, I measure in the cytosol, we can see a nice increase. It's, 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 uh, those response is it's, it's really nice. And then uh, if you measure in the plasma membrane, this cytosolic ROS can actually reach the plasma membrane, which 
means uh, ROS can diffuse from cytosol plus from membrane, which is more or less expected. What's, what's not expected is this free pass of hydrogen peroxide from the cytosol to the nuclear, which is, which is really interesting, but I, I would expect nuclear have more, a bit more um, protection, but apparently not that much, at least in this setting. And then we measure in the mitochondria, of course. And we measure in the intermembrane first, first and we can see just a little bit. So uh, this, was, this was really nice. It was unexpected as well. And when we measure in the mitochondrial matrix, we can't see it really at all. So that means cytosolic hydrogen peroxide stay in the cytosol and doesn't move to the mitochondria, which is more or less the same we see during in vivo exercise with the raw GFP. So what is actually controlling this uh, novel compartmentalization in skeletal muscle? So what is known so far is that hydrogen peroxide produced in the cells reacts with many molecules, but not that many how we can actually uh, uh, think. So as you can see in this list, phosphatases are there, some raw GTPases, lutathione, and, but the sign that took 99% of the hydrogen peroxide produced in a cell is the, this group called peroxoreductions. Not, it's not even catalase, it's peroxoreductions. So peroxoreductions is a family of very uh, sophisticated uh, enzymes. They are count uh, like a more or less 1% of all proteins in a cell. They are very abundant, and they, re they are required for keeping uh, compartmentalization of redox signals in some cells. But we don't really know what they are actually doing in skeletal muscle. So what is interesting on those enzymes, peroxoreductions, they are actually compartmentalized in, in different cellular compartments. So for instance, peroxyreduxin 2 is in the cytosol, and peroxyreduxin 3 is in the mitochondria. So when we produce specifically hydrogen peroxide in the cytosol, you will see that uh, hydrogen peroxide is able to produce dimerization of the peroxyreduxin. This is an oxidation-dependent process. They get dimers if you run them in a Western blotting. Non-reducing Western blotting, you will see dimerization. So what we can see here in this experiment using chemogenetic is that when we produce ROS in the cytosol, only peroxyreduxin 2 get oxidized, but not the mitochondrial one. So this is another, with another technique, we show that this is really compartment dependent. But then uh, you may say this is, this is a bit artificial, and it is, but then we, we did some electrical stimulation in, in, in muscle cells. And we can see the same, but we see in vivo with the Roger FP system that electrical stimulation induced peroxyreduction, per, uh, oxidation of peroxyreduction 2 in the cytosol, but not the mitochondrial peroxyreduction. This again suggests that this is very regulated. So we want to uh, disrupt this uh, compartmentalization, and we're going to do it in mitochondria. Why? Because mitochondrial ROS emission is one of the most uh, ex most common experiment performing redox biology. So people measure mitochondrial emission from the mitochondria to the cytosol using the system. So we want to do this, but uh, hopefully in intact cells. So, so you have to remember that the peroxyreduction system is actually up, is downstream of the thyroidoxin system and the thyroidoxin reductase. And we use inhibition of the thyroidoxin reductase system to keep to inhibit the recycling of peroxyreduction. That means keep them oxidized. When they are oxidized, they are actually inhibited. So we did that experiment, and we produced ROS in the mitochondria and measured the oxidation of the cytosolic peroxyreduction. And we, what we can see is when we uh, have intact cells with the thyroidoxin uh, system intact, we can see that mitochondrial ROS will not leave the mitochondria in healthy conditions. But if you, re if you inhibit the thyroidoxin system, mitochondrial ROS will actually leave the mitochondria. So this system is actually probably very important to keep ROS production within the mitochondria. We did the same with uh, removing peroxyreduxin from the cells, and when we do that, we produce ROS in the, in, the, in, the, in the mitochondria, it leaves the mitochondria. So I say what is happening, what is happening in the mitochondria stay in the mitochondria, at least in hydrogen peroxide uh, in this hydrogen peroxide context in cell, in healthy cells. So we wanted to know whether these uh, peroxyreduxins, uh, we just showed that they are really important controlling intracellular 
hydrogen peroxide, but we wanted to know what is the impact in, in at the whole body, whole body level. So we, uh, we generate this uh, inducible muscle-specific uh, knockdown uh, flies that uh, remove peroxyrioxin 2 and 3. And um, we did a lot of measurement. We have a lot of information about these flies, uh, is, which are really interesting. But today, I'm going to show you only this, which is the physical performance of the climbing performance in these flies is severely reduced uh, in, in, in the flies, like in uh, these two enzymes. Well, it's also interesting that life one is reduced. So removing peroxyridoxins from the muscles of the flies, it will reduce life one. So we wanted to know whether uh, there is any intervention that can actually reinforce or enhance this compartmentalization we see in fibers or uh, muscle fibers. So, of course, exercise training could be a, a mechanism how to actually reinforce the compartmentalization. So we measure um, peroxyridoxins, total levels of peroxyridoxin uh, after a, a period of training in, in mice muscle, in mouse muscle, and we can see that exercise is a powerful stimuli for increasing the total protein content. And this seems to be uh, dependent on PGC1 alpha. But the interesting thing is, uh, at least in the, pero the cytosolic peroxyridoxin, not only increase the total protein, also reduce the oxidation state. So you have to think uh, the, oxi the oxidation state is the uh, ability of the peroxyridoxin to actually promote hydrogen peroxide degradation. So the more reduced they are, the better shape, the, in better shape they are. So this suggests that exercise promote this, all this, uh, some of this benefit uh, just by controlling the compartmentalization of redox signaling. Of course, we want to see this in humans. I'm working in Copenhagen, so um, we measure uh, peroxyridoxin response to exercise training in young and elderly people. Uh, and we observe that this uh, response is actually conserved in humans. So it's, it's a really conserved response from flies, mouse to humans. Um, then um, what was interesting is that uh, peroxyridoxin 3 response to exercise training was actually reduced in elderly people. And if we combine that, this data with the flies that, uh, with reduced lifespan, it, it gives us some ideas what to do next. So this is uh, the model. So we have an uh, enzyme that is able to degrade hydrogen peroxide, but it's also inhibited by hydrogen peroxide. And it will control the movement of hydrogen peroxide to different cellular compartments. And when he, this enzyme is inhibited, hydrogen peroxide can move from one place to another that may not, may not move in physiological conditions. So what we think, this could be one of the uh, mechanisms how oxidative stress can promote uh, the development of some chronic diseases. This is my conclusions. Yeah, so I need to thank so many people because I have, I, I'm so lucky to work where I work, with the group I, group, I, I work. Um, I have to thank first to my Supervisor, PhD supervisor, uh, which is Thomas Jensen, which is in the audience. Also, my, my supervisor from the master and PhD, which is Enrique Heimwich. And this was a perfect combination of having been a redox lab, moving to an exercise metabolism lab. Um, I'm, I'm really lucky to work, I've been able to work in these two labs. Um, and also very lucky to be part of this fantastic group of uh, very smart and friendly people. Um, so thank you, Thomas, for building this nice group. And then I also very lucky to work in the Auswalk section for molecular physiology, where I have learned a lot from the very best, especially, uh, so Eric helped me a lot with the human experiment. I have received a lot of help from uh, Ligia Silo. Um, so both of them are a true, true inspiration for my, for my career. Then I also have uh, received a lot of help from apart from my group, from uh, Lika's group, so Stefan and Fu. And then I have also received a lot of help from different collaborators that allow us to measure, to study ROS generation from the single cell level to the uh, human muscle. So with that, uh, I will be happy to take any question. Yeah.
questions? I, th I think that, oh, here comes Chris. Oxidation can be something that takes a little while to um, be absorbed in. Um, it's so complicated, so it's an, an amazing piece of work that you're putting together there. <laughs> Chris. Hi, Carlos. Very nice presentation. I have to do this, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, I think I told you, we show your paper, the Nature Communication paper in my grad class. And so one of the fun things about showing papers in grad class is you have smart students that ask you questions you don't know how to answer. <laughs> so I'm going to ask it to you. Um, it's really exciting, right? The idea of this contraction sensitive NADPH oxidase 2 superoxide generator that can regulate glucose uptake. And one of the questions that was asked was once the glucose comes into the cell, it will start generating NADPH through a variety of different enzymes related to glucose metabolism. For example, perhaps, we don't really know, but perhaps the pentose phosphate pathway is an enzyme in the TCA cycle that will do it. And will that NADPH not generate more superoxide through NADPH oxidase and now create a feed forward of constant glucose uptake? And obviously that doesn't happen. And then you did some very nice discussion and experiments on compartmentation. What are your thoughts on what we don't know yet about how to compartmentalize the NOx-derived superoxide signal for regulating glucose uptake without it being a runaway system? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Thank you. It wasn't mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so any DBH is complicated because it's a, it's a source of NOx2 to produce ROS, but it's also the source for antioxidant enzyme to actually remove ROS. So the perfect balance between ROS generation and ROS removal depend on NADPH. And as you say, you have this uh, cytosolic source of NADPH, which is pentose phosphate. And we don't really know much about that in muscle, and it's really important. I, I think people is not paying that much attention. Is uh, I think glycolysis is more sexy in that sense. No one going to study uh, uh, pentose phosphate pathway because it, it seems very complicated. Every time I want to look at that, I say, no, this is too complicated. Let's move uh, <laughs> around. Uh, but yeah, so then you have compartmentalized NADPH as well. Um, so, so all the peroxoreductions and the glutathione peroxidase is fed by uh, mitochondrial um, NADPH and then uh, the cytosolic are, so they, that, that transfer of electron to the plasma to the mitochondria is, is really interesting. And, I don't have the answer now, but I hope uh, we can have it in the future. And, um, and about the, yeah, so when you have an increase in, a, in, in glucose metabolism, uh, so there is a nice paper of uh, David James group where they show that insulin actually promotes uh, mitochondrial ROS by increasing glucose flux to the mitochondria. Um, so I think it's, it's a lot of stuff we don't really know yet. Uh, but uh, this compartmentalization, which is the second question, I think it's really important to actually dissect different raw sources. So people is trying to take antioxidants to remove ROS, and they are just taking general antioxidants. That's changed the whole redox state of the cell. So I think moving to more specific antioxidants, which is something the field has been trying to do with the MitoQ, for instance, mito, mito Q, yeah, um, it's really, really important. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I had a very nice chat with Malcolm Jackson after his talk about the future in, in, in understanding compartmentation, perhaps down to super complex concepts. Do we know anything yet about how the reductase and the NADPH oxidase, like glutathione reductase, which is NADPH driven, mm -hmm. which is lower ROS, and the NADPH sensitive NADPH oxidase, which generates the ROS, might exact, actually exist in ter tertiary you know, complex three-dimensional structures that we haven't even begun to consider beyond, yeah. beyond uh, just cytosol, mitochondria, nucleus. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's for sure one of the stuff we need to do, so, yeah. but I think. Thanks, Carlos. Carlos, I noticed that you had aquaporin in the schematic. Is it, um, was that necessary if, as part of your schematic? And does it need to be aquaporin one or all that's in muscle, or is it generic? Yeah, that's, that's a very nice question. So people have suggested that the aquaporins actually are the ones that transport hydrogen peroxide across the membranes. Um, so there is a whole um, trend to study aquaporins, especially mitochondria. 
There is no evidence yet. I think iron peroxide can easily go through the membrane, um, especially in T tubules. I think T tubules are key place where iron peroxide is, is produced because of this mutation of uh, superoxide by SO3, and then easily enter again. Um, that's why we, when we measure the, this P47 Roger P oxidation, it, it gets oxidized really quickly because it, uh, there's um, hydrogen peroxide enter again. And if you use an extracellular catalase, you actually remove the signal inside of, this, of the muscle cell. So it's clearly that you have hydrogen peroxide going from outside in case of the membrane, but I mean, T-tubules are also inside of the muscle, so they are, they are, they are actually inside, right? So it's, that transport is, is quite uh, fast. And we want to also investigate a little bit, uh, which is this uh, mediated transport by aquaporin, or it's just a deep, uh, easy diffusion through the membrane. That is a good Thank question. You. Yeah, really great talk. Thank you. Um, just a curiosity. I was wondering, because you said when the system works well, ROS basically stays in mitochondria. But you also showed quickly that superoxide can escape from complex 3. And I actually always thought this is an important signaling mechanism. So would you? think this is actually rather something negative that the superoxide can escape through complex three or would you say it's uh, still necessary to, I don't know, like for signaling to stimulate muscle growth or whatever? Yeah, I, th I think, uh, I think it, uh, especially the intermembrane space, probably it's easier to go out, but for sure not from the, from the membrane. So that, that's, that's actually a good question. But at least during exercise, we don't really see any escape or any, anything. Uh, in the case of insulin resistance, that's a completely different story. So that's what people have think or have questioned this about good ROS and bad ROS just because the amount of ROS. And we really think it's location, location, location. It's where the, those ROS are produced are one of the main factors as well. Uh, probably you produce a lot of ROS in the mitochondria, we leave the mitochondria anyways. Um, but that's a factor we could actually control if it's, this transport is mediated by aquaporins or by uh, this uh, mitochondrial transition pore. You can actually try to inhibit the, uh, the leaking of uh, hydrogen peroxide from the mitochondria in a, trying to find a target for treating those diseases. But that's what ac actually we're working right now. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, well, please join me in congratulating Carlos again for his prize today. And I invite Dr. Hood back to the stage. Yeah, today is May 28th, and May 28th has never been a famous day or an important day for me, but today, May 28th, is one of the best days of the year <laughs> because uh, we've been working for four years plus to get this conference together, and I'm delighted that you are here, and our speakers came, and you came with enthusiasm, and that's the first thank you I've got to say, is thanks to all of you and to all of your enthusiasm and, and to the speakers who gave great presentations. So give yourself a hand here. I mean, come on. I mean, I think, I think we, uh, we benefited from the enthusiasm of uh, getting back together. And, uh, you know, it was a roller coaster, to be quite honest, with the COVID waves and vaccination rates and space restrictions and all of that balancing act over the course of the last year really made it a pins and needles type of uh, are we going to have success or not. And we have just over 400 people at this meeting. So I'm really delighted uh, that you guys had the enthusiasm to come, and I thank you very much. Um, I want to thank also the uh, International Research Group, uh, the biology of, uh, Biochemistry of Exercise, especially Mark Franco and uh, Robin Murphy, for their continued support of our, and having faith in us, uh, our local organizing committee, myself, Chris Perry, Angelo Belcastro, thank you to them, uh, having faith in us uh, to pull this off. And I also want to say thanks to Frank Booth. Frank, are you here? Is he? No? Anyway, Frank was great. Frank has come many times. He's a, he's a great, uh, he's got a great historical perspective, 
and he's a great advisor and a great sense of humor, and I want to uh, pay tribute to him. I want to thank also the organized, the, the, my, my main man, Joe Orecchio, at the back. You got many emails from Joe. His company is called Road Ahead Group, and they're a great conference planning group, and I just uh, think you did a wonderful job, and a, you're a great communicator, so thank you very much, uh, Joe. Um, right, I want to thank my lab. I want to thank my lab members, I mean, for their uh, putting up with my whining in lab meeting about what I have to do next and all of that, and giving me advice uh, on don't do this, do this, this is better. You know, I, I, I'm very grateful for you, for your help and your advice, especially in lab meeting. Okay, so our next job, I think I've said all the thank yous. Uh, I think I don't, I want to thank the AV company too. There's Z at the back there. You guys were great. Yeah. AV Canada. There's, there's nothing that'll make a meeting go downhill uh, more than AV difficulties, right? And so you guys were just seamless. I mean, really very, very good. Um, so we have a few awards and uh, we had sponsorship for the first time. We had three sponsors. We had the Muscle Health Research Center. We had the American Journal of Physiology, Cell Physiology, Associate Editor uh, Tom Hawk, and we have the Journal of Applied Physiology, Editor-in-Chief Sue Bodine, who uh, gave us some funds for student awards. Is Sue here? Good you're here. Okay. You're going to help me in just one moment, okay? Um, I want to just explain how these awards went. We had 214 abstracts, right, and six judges had the tough job of narrowing it down to 10% of that. So we got down to 20, and, uh, and, and frankly, the, the abstracts were superb. Really, really, and you just had to go to the poster room to look at these wonderful posters and abstracts. Really superb, and I, I'm so happy about that. So difficult task initially to get down from 214 down to 20, and then 13 judges, 13 judges, uh, ranked the posters, and uh, in full transparency, I was not one of those, and there was not a York University person on that, that committee of 13. There was not. So it was uh, a, a broad committee that didn't include us. Um, so uh, I've got in my hot hands here the uh, eight winners is a certificate inside, uh, a fake certificate. We'll send you the, the uh, official one. I didn't have time to print the, the best one um, because we just finalized this, this today. So um, we're going to take a photo of each winner. There are three master's winners um, whose work was done during their master's degree and five PhD winners whose work was done during their PhD. They're going to come up here. Sue is going to help me. She's going to hand out the awards. The name is on the front, Sue, the sponsor, and the university. We haven't had a chance to rehearse. Uh, but come on up here. Come on up. So it's a, it's a, it's a great honor to have Sue Bodine here. Sue is uh, an honored member. Yeah, 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 yeah. You bet. She is an honored member of the American Physiological Society, right? She uh, is given the uh, Edward Adolph lecture. She's the editor-in-chief of JAP. I mean, just an important person and uh, a totally appropriate to give out these awards. All right. Um, oh, it also comes not only with the certificate, but also $250, which will be sent if you're not here. If, so if, if the, if the uh, student is not here, that's no problem. We won't be able to get a photo today, but uh, we will get a photo and we will send the award to them. So, first awards are the Emmy, uh, um, Master Student Awards. We've got three of them here. And Sue, you just have to read this, this, and this, and the person will come I up. I can read your name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, right there, there, and there. Okay, this oh. one, oops. Yeah. Uh, sponsored by the MHRC, Marie Bell Ayub from McGill University. Photographers here, oh. come on up, come on up. Uh, 
Uh, this is uh, uh, American Journal of Physiology, Cell Physiology, uh, Catherine Manta, McMaster University. And our third ward is uh, sponsored by the Journal of Applied Physiology, Michaela Slavin, Slavin from York University. PhD awards, five of those, and here is the first one. So we got from, uh, sponsored by MHRC, Martin, is it Eisman de Almeida from the University of South Denmark. So there's two from MHRC? So, okay. Another PhD from uh, MHRC, uh, Jessen Soren from the University of Copenhagen. <laughs> this is not here. Not here? Not here? Okay. Next one. Um, another from uh, MHRC, Andrew McHale from McMaster University. From the Journal of Applied Physiology, Aaron McGowan from Oregon State University. And our last one from American Journal of Physiology Cell, Ashley Olivier from York University. <laughs> Congratulations to all the winners. And thank you for, to David and the organizing committee. This was a great uh, meeting, and it was great to be able to meet in person for their. <laughs> Our last order of business is to invite Dr. Mark Franco up here uh, to uh, say, say farewell to everyone. Thank you, David. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Thus, I have now to, to close this International Biochemistry of Exercise uh, Conference in, in Toronto. I would like uh, to thank all of you for your attendance. I hope uh, that uh, this conference uh, has reached your expectation. Again, I would like to thank uh, David and his team for the fantastic work they, they have done. Uh, I'd, yes, thank you. Of course, I'd like also to 
uh, to thank the, the sponsors for their, their support and uh, the speakers for the time they have spent to, to prepare the presentation and for the nice presentation we had and uh, in very interesting uh, discussion. I have now two uh, announcements uh, to, to make. The first one is that we have decided uh, to change the frequency of the International Biochemistry of Exercise Conference. Uh, before, we organized IBEC every three years, and in the future, we will organize IBEC every two years. The, the next IBEC will be organized in 2024. And, and the second announcement is that uh, the next IBEC will be organized... <laughs> in the uh, University of Limerick in uh, Ireland between uh, July 9 and 11, 2024. 20, uh, this Limerick is situated in the southwest of uh, Ireland near the International Airport of Shannon. It's easy to go there. Uh, there is a local organizing uh, committee which is uh, led it by Brian Carson, and I think that uh, Brendan Egan is there. This congratulation, of course, this team uh, to be to be awarded by the uh, the organization of the the next uh, the next IBEC. Uh, the the next IBEC will be organized in the facilities of the of the university itself, and uh, we will pay uh, special attention to, to reduce the cost for uh, the, the students to improve the, the participation. Uh, please visit on a regular basis our website so that you can follow the, the preparation of, uh, of, this, uh, of the next IBEC. And uh, I wish you a safe trip back home Thank you for attending this IBEC and see you in two years in Limerick. Bye-bye.